we got Zoom going. Okay, so let's uh, hope to finish the second chapter today. I need to finish up what we started last time with the integration. So go grab your Jupyter Notebooks. Um, remember, last time we discussed the three um, more advanced <laughs> rules, the Simpsons rule and the, uh, the trapezoidal rule and the Simpsons uh, one third and three eighths rules. And we, uh, we said in the end that, uh, hold on. We said in the end that the easiest one to apply on discrete data was the trapezoidal rule. And that's the one kind of we're gonna adopt. So we're gonna go ahead and implement the trapezoidal rule routine in Python um, and try to integrate that same function that we were dealing with last time. Okay, so grab your notebooks should have also some gaps for you for the trapezoidal rule for discrete data. Okay, this is the formula, B minus A over two times F of A plus F of B, okay? Let's grab that Jupyter notebook, Google Drive. So go ahead and get started on that while I figure out what is going on on my computer. Which I did. Okay, figured it out. Integration. Yes, yeah, so that is going to be activity four. Okay, that's gonna be activity four. Let me move the window to the other one. Okay, so that's gonna be on activity four. To, this is the trapezoidal root, uh, rule routine. I call it trap rule F, which takes a continuous function F. We haven't applied it on discrete data yet. That's gonna be next. Remember, like we did last time, we had the same two versions of each rule, one for continuous functions and one for discrete data, x, i, y, i. So we're going to do the same thing here. Um, but this time, we're going to start with the trapezoidal rule for a function f. And you can inspire from what we did previously for uh, the left, right, and um, midpoint rules, for example, um, over here, left point rule, right? So exactly what we did over there. Okay. But this is gonna integrate a function over an interval from A to B with N segments, okay? So we're no longer doing just one, a, one segment, we're doing N segments like we did with the improved left, right, and midpoint rules, okay? On a function, continuous function F. <laughs> Okay, so we can really reuse what we did last time. Um, to create the segments, okay, so I needed my meaning of N. You can have whatever meaning you want, but my meaning, because I created this function, what I intend N to be is the number of segments. Therefore, to create those segments, I am gonna use lin space and create N plus one points like we did last time. So my lin space is gonna be from A to B with n plus one points, okay? My result or the summation, call it result, let's say, um, is starts with zero, okay? And then I need to loop over the segments, okay? So this is just simply a counter. I'm gonna start from segment zero 
two, we have n segments. So I'm going to start from segment zero and go to segment n minus one. Okay, that gives me n segments. And for the range function, I start from zero and put the stop at n because range is open at the right hand side. So it goes from zero to n minus one, really. And that's just an index. So it gives us n intervals. And we start with um, now for each segment, A is the point to the left, so that's xi, and B is the point to the right, xi plus on. And then we simply imp implement the formula for the trapezoidal rule, which is half um, B minus A times F of A plus F of B. Okay, now let me execute my F over here, which is my function. Okay. And then the keynote, we were asked to do the interval, the integral from uh, zero to one of my function f. Okay, so we can go from zero to one, integrate. Oh, this is quad the quadrature uh, function. Okay, because I want to evaluate an error. So that's the exact one. Integrate dot quad my f from a to b fine and gave me um, uh, this kind of what I'm going to call an exact uh, result. Now for my trapezoidal rule, say, you know, you start with like 10 intervals, um, you apply trap rule from zero to one. And what I'm doing here, I'm computing uh, the error. Okay. As we, okay. So this is kind of a little bit ahead of uh, what I wanted to do. Do you have that on your gaps? Yes, you do. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so we'll start with this, just um, n equal 10, so started in its own cell, and you apply the trapezo trapezoidal rule, that gives you, you know, print V1, no, 1.2703, 1 etc. Now you can compare this one to that one as an approximate error, treat this as the more approximate one, or you can compare the trap rule to itself. Okay, by increasing the number of intervals. For example, what if you double the number of intervals? So if you were to double the number of intervals, you'd get V2 is trap rule F. You give it my function F going from A to B. And let's double the num number of intervals. So two times N and then print V2. It improved the approximation. Okay, so 1.27 to one point. 1.270 to 1.272, okay? So it's gonna keep increasing the uh, approximation as expected, right? The more intervals you put, the better you're gonna approximate that integral and, and it is gonna converge, okay? What I'm showing in these next cells is really kind of um, just a moot point now, just trying to evaluate an error. You can just delete those. I don't know why, why I still have them here. All right, so now we'll switch back to, uh, the keynote. Sorry, I'm going a little faster because I need to cover um, the next chapter. I need to finish it today. Okay. So now we did the trapezoidal rule for continuous function, for a continuous function. Now we wanna, we wanna redo the routine, but for discrete data, because we wanna go back to the CO2 emissions data and apply the trapezoidal rule to that. So that's gonna be activity five in your notebook. You can switch to the notebook. So now in this case, trap rule, I'm giving it X, Y. Okay, so those are um, just arrays, right? The X contains the values of the independent variable and Y contains the values of the dependent variable. You have no control over intervals here because those are given to you through the data. But thankfully, the trapezoidal rule only uses the left point and the right point, okay? So give it a minute, take a minute, see, see if you can do it. We did this last time with the midpoint, with the left and right point rule. So it's gonna look essentially um, exactly the same. <clears throat> now, Notice here, I declared N as the number of points that we have, okay? So if you wanna loop, if you wanna treat this loop as looping over segments, 
you have n points, therefore you have n minus one segments. Okay, so if you want to start with segment zero, segment one, segment two, then your range is going to be zero to n minus one, right? Because the upper bound on range is open. So in other words, if you have n points, you have n minus one segments. And if you start counting those segments from zero, the count is going to be zero, one, two, to n minus two. Gives you n minus one segments. So that's how I'm going to treat that. Got to call this uh, result. Okay. For i in range, zero, starting from segment zero, segment one, segment two, to n minus one, because the last segment, if I'm starting from zero, the last segment has index n minus two, okay? So with range, you go to n minus one because range is gonna stop at n minus one, at the end point minus one. Now, why do I start my range from zero? Because it makes my indexing of the arrays simpler because all Python arrays are zero based. So when I access the xi for the first i, I'm accessing the first point x0, okay? So now for interval i, the left point is xi and the right point is xi plus one. fa is yi and fb is yi plus one, right? And then you simply apply the formula 0 0.5 times b minus a times fa plus fb, right? And then result, result. Okay, so you see what I did here. I tried to make it look like the, the form we used in the continuous, uh, for the continuous function, F A to indicate that this is F at A, okay? And then you return the result. You apply the trap rule to your data. Let's see where's our data. If you haven't loaded your data, you gotta come load it here from activity three, those are your data. And you run it, you're gonna get a different number than mine because your, um, yeah, your data stops at 2014, my data stopped at 2016. So that's the difference. You should get like 223 was the number you got, 223, yeah. Numerical integration in practice, you're just gonna use scipy.integrate.quad or numpy.trabzi and forget about it, okay? I mean, really, that's why this chapter is short. You know, I just wanted to show you the mechanics of how this works, but in the end, you're gonna, that's what we all use, you know? We're, we're not gonna beat those amazing routines that exist out there. It's a simple problem, numerical integration. Don't worry about it. We spent one lecture on it to learn how it works so that, you know, you're an engineer not just someone who's using blindly, right? So you know what's going on behind the scenes, but we're done, okay? All right, let's switch now. The next chapter is gonna be on the opposite of integration, which is differentiation. Now again, the next chapter is short and I'm hoping to cover it today. But it's kind of a weird chapter because I, I never feel that, like I feel everyone sleep, falls asleep during that chapter. I fall asleep during my, <laughs> that chapter because it's like, you know, why are we doing this? We don't get it yet. Is this gonna be useful, right? How useful it is. Also, although your homework problem is, gonna, is cool, you know, I, I ask you to, to predict the speed of a UFO flying over Salt Lake City, you know, using numerical differentiation. But, you know, the power of, this numerical differentiation comes in the end of the, at the end of the semester, when we start doing ODEs and when I use finite difference methods to solve those ODEs. So bear with me here, okay? We'll do our best to get through it. Um, it's a short chapter as well, just a bunch of formulas that you take and apply, okay? Some fundamental concepts that are gonna show up once we hit ordinary differential equations, okay? I hope at the end of this chapter, you'll be able to define um, what we mean by the finite difference method, where we essentially take a continuous function and approximate its derivatives numerically. That's it, using, that's where the word comes, finite difference. Numerically compute first and second derivatives for discrete data, as well as continuous functions. 
um, define and estimate the convergence rate of finite difference schemes, what we mean by you know, a second order method or a first order method or a fourth order method. You've probably heard of those words, but they're gonna rear their head over here in this chapter. Define what is meant by order of accuracy of a given finite difference method. That's essentially identical to the convergence rate. And use Taylor's theories to derive um, a couple of finite difference schemes. Okay. So we start by taking this was in 2000, um, 2019, like once the COVID 19 hit. And we were still in class, you know, we were still coming to, I remember. I remember discussing this, um, um, discussing this in class, and uh, you know we haven't had any cases yet. And I sh showed everyone this plot of um, total COVID-19 cases um, for mainland China and the world. Now notice, it's the blue um, is for mainland China, and the orange is total cases in the world. And you notice that initially they fall all on top of each other because it was mainly restricted in mainland China, right? And until like probably the month of, you know, once we hit end of February, end of April, I think like 30 days into the outbreak, that's where it started spreading through the whole world, okay? And then you see like the cases pick up, the, or the cases in orange pick up through the entire world. So that adds in the cases in mainland China plus the rest of the world. And then it goes up exponentially after that. And that's where we had to go home and switch everything online, et cetera. Uh, and then I asked the class, and I'm asking you, how would you calculate the current trade, given this data, you have total cases per day, on the x-axis you have per day, y-axis total cases, how would you calculate the rate of spread of COVID-19? So from this graph, you have a rate of change of COVID-19 of cases per day, right? You can say, oh, look, you know, initially, we had maybe, you know, two, three cases per day, but as we start picking up here, right, the slope is going up, right, and you're increasing the number of um, cases per day. So how would you predict that? If I gave you this data, given what you know so far um, in numerical methods or any other kind of crazy ideas you might have, how would you calculate the rate of spread of COVID-19? Go, oh, talk. And you cannot go to the CDC website and, you know, or, or the WHO. What? What? Well, pardon me. I wrote my UNOT paper over break. Oh. Oh. The whole thing. Uh, to apply for the for the funding for the summer. Okay. Didn't your kind of advisor or mentor help you a little bit with it with the paper? No. <laughs> well, I've helped. I don't know. We when I had UROP um, students with me, like we always kind of work together on the proposal, that's kind of the proposal, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All good. Okay, so ideas, who's got some ideas? Kevin, you got an idea? Go ahead. The slope, yeah. Yeah. So put, put an interpolant between the data, either like a cubic spline or linear interpolant and really get the slope, right? That's pretty valid, Rich. Okay, um, and then differentiate that model, differentiate the model. Okay, what are the challenges with that though? 
very low. Um, why? Well, you can you could have a polynomial. You could have complex functions still result with linear regression, right? So not are you a straight line? Straight line, yeah, that's going to be a bad idea. But you can do linear regression with more with other functions, polynomials, etc. But the challenge there is. What kind of model are you going to use for this day, for these data? I'm um, like, is it sine, cosine, square root, logarithm, combination? You know, what kind of combination would you use for that? So instead of using a straight line, I would use a more complex model, but you know, it's going to take some time to figure to figure out what model is going to fit those data. And especially after 40 days, because you know the cases go up and then go down and then fluctuate. So any other ideas? You had an interesting idea. What is H? H is zero, so it's I plus one minus X I, and then yeah. uh, F of X plus H is Y I plus one, and then F of okay. X is Y I. Okay. So you get an approximate Y I plus one plus Y I divided by Y I plus one minus X I, uh, no, X I plus one minus X I. Okay. So I think what he's saying is just do rise over run. You take every two points, right? You get the rise divided by the run, and whether those points are equally spaced or not, right? This is exactly what we're going to do today. So all of those ideas are feasible. Fitting an interpolant, local interpolant, global interpolant, doing a regression model, finding the best kind of um, uh, uh, functions, basis functions, okay? Linear, even nonlinear regression. We don't know how to do it, but we'll learn to eventually. Or doing what Kimball said, which is called the finite difference method. And that's what we're going to focus on. Because we know how to do the other things, right? So we, gotta, we wanna learn something new, okay? Um, some of the ideas, um, so every year, um, yeah, every year we, I kinda get this similar set of ideas. The regression is, uh, I think ha, I call, this is like the third time that I hear about the regression, but the, so, you know, fit polynomial, local polynomial, or do what Kimball suggested, which is the finite difference method, which is based on the use of what we call the Taylor series, which you've heard of, okay? So the Taylor series, I, I love Taylor series. A lot of even advanced research we're doing right now with complex computational fluid dynamics work always goes back to fundamental Taylor series because it is so powerful. It allows you to take any function and rip it apart, approximate it, if you know only the value of that function at one point, and you know its derivatives, you'll be able to know everything about that function, okay? The Taylor series of a function of x at any x, we say the Taylor series around a fixed point x naught. So you say, okay, I wanna do my Taylor series around one, right? or Taylor series around 1.3, whatever doesn't matter. It says that f of x at any point in the neighborhood of x0, okay, looks like f of x0 plus f prime of x0 times the difference between that point x and x0 plus 1 over 2 factorial f double prime at x0 times x, the distance between x and x0 squared, and so on. This is an exact expression. If you can retain the infinite, all the terms, it's an exact expression. There's an equal sign. Now, early on, when we were talking about errors, we approximated the sine function or the exponential using Taylor series, right? So we said, okay, sine looks like this is the expansion of the sine function. I know what the sine function is. I know its derivatives, you know, and then I can compute it at neighboring points. But we said we clearly cannot, cannot compute all the terms because they're infinite. So we truncate it. We say we take one term, two terms, three terms, four terms, right? And we evaluated the error um, at that point. So now I'm going to show you a graph of <clears throat> what this looks like if you were to, as you truncate, as you add more and more terms. So what you're looking at here in the dashed black line is an exponential function. That's a true function. We know what it is, and this is the plot. And then I'm going to take that exponential function, okay, and write a Taylor series of e of x around point x naught equal one, okay? Around this point. And I'm gonna take 
um, one term, f of x zero, and then two terms, and then three terms, and then four terms, okay? So when I take four terms, it says f of x at any x, okay, is equal to f of x zero plus some error, right? And that's that red line. <laughs> it's a constant, right? f of x zero is a constant, x zero is a fixed point. Now, if I add one more term, if I add to f of x zero, I add x minus x zero times f prime of x zero, that's gonna give me a straight line, right? Because the only unknown is gonna be x, that's kind of the variable, and x, all the other ones are fixed. So that gives me this blue line. If I add one more term, I'm gonna get a quadratic. So I get um, this um, green, light green line. And then if I add one more term, I'm gonna get a cubic. So get this purple line, but notice in the neighborhood of x zero, all of these functions, like if you zoom in really, really closely, all of these functions are indistinguishable. All of these terms are very close to each other. So that tells us something. If you are very close to x zero, whether you retain one, two or three terms, it's pretty darn good approximation. It's only when you depart that you start diverging from the true function. And notice as you depart from x zero, the one that has the most terms, the purple one covers the mo falls more on top of the original function, okay? Now we're gonna take that Taylor series and we're gonna invert the concept of the Taylor series, okay? Because right now this Taylor series assumes that you know what f of x is. Okay, but what if you don't? What are you gonna do with this? What can you do with this Taylor series? We're gonna show you, okay? So suppose that you have a set of data, whether continuous or discrete, okay? That is given to you as independent variables, xi, x1, x2, you know, all the way to xi, all the way to xn. So you got n points. And corresponding to those independent values, you have dependent, values f of x1, f of x2, f of x3, et cetera, and so on, okay? Just data pairs, x, y, right? Whether discrete or continuous, it's not gonna matter, right? Now I wanna simplify things. I wanna call f of x i, f sub i, okay? Just for simplicity. So you know f2, f sub two is f at x2. That's the value of the dependent, va dependent variable at x2. And let's shrink them you know, so that it's simpler to deal with. So you have a set of data points, x1, x2, and set of values. Now the distance between um, the axes, we're gonna fix it at h, equal spacing everywhere. We're gonna extend that to an unequal spacing later. But for simplicity now, we're gonna assume that the spacing between x1 and x2 is the same as the spacing between any, oh, any of these two points. Now this should remind you of what we did with the heat transfer problem, right? When we discretized and we had that delta X, that's the same thing, H, okay? Okay, now ask the question, given function values, the Taylor series is useful in finding the derivatives of that function. In other words, given these data, I'm gonna ask this question, if only I know the value at x1 and the, va the value of f at x1, the value of f at x2 and so on. If I only know those data, nothing else, not the derivatives, not the first, not the second, et cetera. How can we use the Taylor series or can we use the Taylor series to find the derivatives? Previously in the definition of the Taylor series, we assumed that we know f and its derivatives, but now we only know f at a fixed point, okay? So how can we use the Taylor series to find the derivatives at any of these points, okay? Find the slope, right? So now we start by asking, I'm gonna guide you through this. We're gonna do it together. The first step is to write this Taylor series at any point xi plus one, okay? I use xi plus one to simplify the algebra, but you, you know, at any point i, go ahead and write down the Taylor series, okay? Just write it like this at xi plus one, around xi. So we're looking for f at xi plus one around xi. So your x naught is gonna be xi, okay? 
write it in this form, right? You know, so you're gonna have the first term is gonna be f of x i, okay, plus you know this term, write a couple of terms only, and then dot dot dot. Okay. So you're looking to evaluate f of x i plus one around f x i. And those are neighboring points, right? They're neighboring points. Doesn't it's just simply adapting this definition to x i plus one and x i. Isn't it hard to do it in your head? <laughs> do you guys need papers or you're just, okay. If you wanna learn it, you're gonna have to write it down and make mistakes and then say, ah, that's my mistake. Can you do symbolic with this? Can you do symbolic stuff? This is not a numerical evaluation. This is an analytical expression. I want to know what fxi plus one looks like around point xi. Okay. Remember, our objective was to get to f prime of xi, which we do not know. But first, we're going to write this Taylor series because I promise you that's going to help us find f prime of xi. Yep, perfect. Okay, so sine minus, right? Yeah. Beautiful. Ah, no, x zero. Okay. And yeah, yeah. Make sure you adjust the x and x zero. Okay, let's see. You need a minute? One more minute? No? Okay, some of you got it. Who wants to take this on? Maxime is smiling. Do you want to take it on? Or no? you don't have an answer? Okay, so what if you substitute x with xi plus one and substitute x zero with xi, right? So you get f of xi plus one over one factorial, f prime at xi, and here you have xi plus one minus xi, right? Plus one over two, f double prime, xi plus one, plus, times xi plus one minus xi squared and so on, right? Just a simple, simple symbolic substitution. That's what I did. I set x equal to xi plus one and x zero equal to xi, okay? Now you can further simplify this. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna replace f of x i plus one with f i plus one and f prime of x i with f prime i and so on, okay? But there's also <clears throat> one more thing we can use to simplify. We said that the spacing between any two points is constant. Any two consecutive points is fixed at h. So if you put, so x i plus one minus x i is h, same thing here, h, so you get h, h squared and so on. So when you do this, you get this really nice compact form that says f i plus one is f i plus h f prime i plus one over two h squared f double prime i, et cetera, okay? Okay, what was our original objective? Oh, blah, what was our original objective? Correct. So now go ahead and solve for f prime i. Just take this equation, move f prime i to the left-hand side and move everything else, else to the right-hand side. Just solve for f prime i. And don't worry about anything else, just solve for f prime i.
Don't forget the dot, dot, dot. There's an infinite number of terms there. If you forgot those terms, if you forgot to put dot, 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 you do not have, you can, you are not allowed to put an equal sign. I mean, you can put it, but it's wrong. It's very wrong. You cannot put an equal sign. If you're putting an equal sign, you're going to keep those dot, dot, dots. Okay. Now try to simplify the terms, like when you divide by H, right? And split out the terms. Don't keep them as a, as a ratio. Okay. Split out the entire, that entire fraction. So it looks like term A, term B, term C. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. You're going to take this on, Jake. Okay. Jake has a beautiful answer for us. Do you want to? So f prime i is equal. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. All divided by h. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Double prime. Uh huh. Okay. Excellent. All right. So this is this is it. All right. Okay. So you need to get to this form <clears throat> for one simple reason. First, it looks more beautiful than the, he, this huge summation divided by H. Second, this term, we know everything about it. We know Fi plus one because that's input data. We know Fi, but we know H. Not only that, that's Kimball's formula, right? That's the rise over run. That's the definition of the derivative you learned in school. Fx plus h minus fx over h, right? That's the definition of the derivative. But now we know the error. Now we know that there are more terms here, an infinite number of them, plus one over two h, f double prime i, which we do not know, and f triple prime and f quadruple prime and so on, okay? So now you ask, what the heck are we going to do with those terms? I'm going to tell you, you're going to neglect all of them. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Because you're going to call that an error. You're technically right, you know, the sign, but it doesn't matter because that error, the sign on that error is meaningless. So we're going to neglect all of those terms. And once we neglect them, we are not allowed to put an equal sign anymore. And we're going to declare that one approximation to the derivative at point i, given only values of f at i, i plus one, i minus one, and so on. At any point i, the approximation to the derivative, one approximation to the derivative, f prime i is f i plus one minus f i over h, with an error that looks like one over two h f double prime i, and so on, plus ad infinitum. Now that is what, what kind of error is this? Is this round off iteration or truncation? So this is truncation error, right? That's exactly a beautiful example of truncation error where we said, okay, we have an approximation, a rational approximation for a derivative, but we can't compute all the other terms. We don't know them. So we neglect them, exactly, I love that. Okay, so we neglect them and call that the truncation error. And we know what it is, we can assess it. And we're gonna quantify it a little bit more, okay? <clears throat> you can show, it takes some uh, finagling <laughs> to show it, um, that this entire error is bounded from above so it cannot go above that value by a constant times the spacing. All of those terms are dominated essentially by this term, H over here, this first term, because the next term is gonna be H squared. The third term is gonna be H cubed, right? They're all dominated by this term and it's bounded from above. It cannot go above a constant times H. 
Now that constant doesn't matter. That constant is related to the maximum value of the F double prime. But it doesn't matter because we rarely need to know that constant in practice to assess our error. What matters to us is to say that this error, we write it mathematically as this symbol OH, that's order H, capital O. What that means is that two functions are order H related to each other if they cannot change asymptotically to each other as a function of H linearly with H, okay? So we call this an error of order H. That has more meaning, okay? But now you can write exactly, so if you bring that order H and put it back in the formula, you can put the equal sign exactly, because you're saying my derivative at Xi is Fi plus one minus Fi over H plus order H. We know the error, we, we quantified the error. It's no more than a constant times H. That's what order H means. It's no more than a constant times H, okay? And this is called the forward difference formula. I'm gonna come back to the error, but I wanna show you visually what the forward difference formula means. Consider this function in red. And at point I, this is the true slope. So suppose you knew F, okay? This is the true slope at point I. Our far forward difference formula, excuse me, gives us a slope that's fi plus one minus fi over delta x gives us this slope. In this case, it's a pretty nasty error, right? It's very different than the true slope, okay? But in other cases, it'll probably be very close to it. Who knows, okay? All right, I'm gonna get back to the error. What's important to consider when thinking about the error is that how, first it tells you how accurate the method is. So our error here is a function of the spacing, H, not the square of the spacing, not the you know, cube of the spacing, just the spacing. And what you can say from that error is that if you cut that spacing in half, so if you get data that is there's more data and there's double the points. You will only cut your error by half, okay? So we can prove this mathematically. We say that if the error with spacing H, if an error, if a method of order H, okay, has data with spacing H, then error at spacing H is constant times H, okay? If you have the spacing, so you get more data, then say h over two, then that error becomes c times h over two, and that's e h over two. So you cut your error by half. If you cut the spacing by half, h to h over two, you cut your error by half. Remember one of the early assignments I gave you where I asked you to compute the derivative, and I asked you to cut the value of h by half and then by fourth, and then compare the ratio of the errors. And you found that some ratios were two and some ratios were, uh, some ratios were half and some ratios were one fourth because we were using a first order method or an order H method. We're gonna see higher order methods later. If you cut the spacing by four, okay, then your error is gonna be, continue to be cut by half, okay? That's very important to know because it tells you how, how much accuracy you're improving by increasing your resolution. Now this has meanings for us when we, when we are doing um, like computational fluid dynamics. In CFD and computational fluid dynamics, you have a, what we call a grid, which is a bunch of points, discrete points. If I'm using a method of order one, of order H, sorry, which is the spacing between these points. If I double my number of points in each direction, Okay, if I'm using a method of order H, then I'm only gonna cut my error in half, but I've spent, I've, but it's gonna cost me a lot more to run that calculation. Whereas if I use a method of order, maybe H squared, then I'm gonna be able to cut the error 
by four, okay? And we'll see next. In general, an approximation is said to be of order of accuracy P or of order P if its truncation error is order H to the P. Or in other words, your error is constant times H to the power P. Okay? So now I ask you this question. So now show that if a method is order H squared, we just did order H. Now take a method that's order H squared and show that if you cut the spacing by half, so you add more points, then your error is going to be reduced by a factor of four. Okay? Do math similar to what we did in the previous slide. So do EH squared and then E, so do EH and then EH over two. The error at spacing H and then the error at spacing H over two. Could be more. Right. You don't know. Maybe you, you might hit a derivative, you know, a func very specific function. But in general, we find that this is pretty darn accurate. So. Don't overcomplicate it. Just E H C H squared. That's always, yeah, that's always the leading, leading term. A anything we throw at it always shows us the correct convergence rate. Yeah, it will. Okay. Okay. I hope you did to try to run it by hand. Got it? Okay. It was fairly obvious. The error at spacing H is CH squared. And the error at spacing, spacing uh, Sean Connery, the error at spacing H, the, the error of spacing H over two is C, whoever remembers knows Sean Connery. <laughs> C H over two squared, all right? So because you now have spacing. So that gives you C H squared over four, which is E H over four. So you cut the error at spacing H by a factor of four, which is tremendous, okay? Just tremendous. Okay. And one more thing before we switch back to finite differences is that if you take this formula, E equal CH to the power P, and then you take the logarithm of it, natural log, and then I ask you <laughs> to plot the curve, log E equal log C. So you take the log, you get log E equal log C plus P log H, okay? So now I ask you to plot that curve on a log log plot. So log E on the y axis, log H on the x axis. What are you going to get? For any method of order P. Uh huh. Yes, thank you, Kimbo. Okay. So on a log log plot, call this Y, call this A and call this B, you get Y equal A plus P, sorry, this is X. <laughs> y equal A plus P times X. So it's a straight line with an intercept log C and slope P, the order of the method. This is very useful in practice. Okay? We might get a chance to do it here, we might not. But this is very useful in practice when you are observing and monitoring the error, testing the order of accuracy of a method you're implementing, what do you do? You cut the spacing in half and measure the error and then plot it on a log log plot. 
And if you get a straight line, the slope of that line gives you the observed order of the method. So if you, indeed you set out to design a method of order four, so h to the four, and then you observe h square, you observed a, a slope of two, you're wrong. You got something wrong. Okay, so you gotta observe a slope of four, okay? That's it. That's what I'm gonna talk about, about the error. But now you've seen big O notation, okay? You've seen what it means, a method of order P. It means it's truncation error, the leading term, or, or the dominant term in the truncation error is a constant times H to the power P, okay? It gets more complicated in multi-dimensions. We're not gonna worry about that, okay? We ask those questions, you know, as you finish up your career, you stop by my office and we can have a big discussion on the board, you know? Some of you have actually done that. It would be nice before you graduate, you know, drop by and say hi and what you're doing. Okay. All right. So now we're going to go to Python for the function f of x equal e to the x. I want you to actually do that plot. Plot the absolute true error for f prime of two using the forward difference formula versus va different values of h, ranging from 10 to the minus five to one. Use a log log plot and you start with the notebook um, with gaps from canvas under finite difference methods. Okay, so we're gonna actually make this plot for the forward difference method. And we know the forward difference method is order H. So we expect that that slope of the error to be slope one, okay, to have one. see do you see a notebook with gaps numerical differentiation thank you yes perfect All right, numerical differentiation. Okay. Okay, so what I'm doing first, I'm taking, computing the true derivative of e to the x, okay, at two. So the derivative of ex is ex, and evaluated at two is e to the two, gives you 7.39, okay? Now here, you gotta define the forward difference routine, which is f x i plus one minus f of x i over the spacing. Now this routine takes in a function h, f, sorry, takes in the point at which you wanna differentiate and an arbitrary spacing h, okay? Arbitrary spacing h, because we wanna go and go ahead and play around with that h. We're gonna keep cutting it in half until we kind of get an idea of the error, okay? So go ahead and implement this. Remember, f is a continuous function here. We're not doing discrete data yet. <coughs> the formula, oh, <laughs> I need to show you the formula, that'd be helpful. <laughs> okay, that's the formula. Okay, so you're gonna truncate it because clearly you don't, you don't know any of that. So you're just gonna use this, okay? Got it? Okay. So I know xi, I know h. I'm simply gonna do f at xi plus h minus f at xi over h, okay? So that returns to me the derivative at point xi. So I can play around with this, okay? I can say df by dx of my function, which is exponential function, the exponential function at point two and with a spacing 0 0.1. That gives me 7.77. If I keep cutting the spacing, it's gonna get closer and closer to the 7.38, okay? 7.39. 
7.3894, right? If you keep cutting it, infinitesimally small, right? That's just the definition of the derivative, okay? That works. Okay, so now my objective is to look at the error, but I also wanna try this out at different spacings H. So I'm gonna start by evaluating the derivative at, um, at a spacing H of one, and then you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, all the way to 10 to the minus five. Okay. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna create a lint space for H, H values, <clears throat> excuse me, got a hundred values. So my objective is to evaluate DF by DX with exponential at 0.2, but at all of these H's, starting with H equal you know, one, and then uh, 0 0.9, and then 0, what, 97, 0 0.95, 0 0.938, all the way to 10 to the minus five. I want to evaluate df by dx at all of those, using all of those spacings, okay? So I define here x um, equal two, and I wanna do this in one shot in Python. Should we loop over the h's? You could loop over the each h value, and save the result and put it in an array, or you could just pass that entire H array to the function. And it should work because we've done nothing that will violate NumPy arrays. If you give it NumPy arrays, it's gonna give you back a NumPy array, okay? So we're gonna evaluate DF by DX at the exp using the exponential function at point um, X equal two, or you can put two, and using all of the H values. Now, what do you expect to see in numeric derivatives? The derivatives of E to the X at point two using all of the spacings declared in H. So this value is at spacing one, this value is spacing 0 0.97, whatever. And this value 7.38909 is at spacing H equal 10 to the minus five. From the definition of the error itself, C times H, as you shrink H, that error is gonna shrink. And this is exactly what we're seeing here, right? This is the highest value of H. This is the lowest, this corresponds to the highest value of H. And this corresponds to the derivative using the lowest value of H, okay? So the next step is to compute an error. And all I have to do is take, I'm just gonna take an absolute value of the error, not relative. I'm gonna take all of those derivatives and subtract from them the true value, which is e to the power two, okay? And we can do this in one shot. And this gives us an array of the errors, right? For each entry in this array, each entry in this array corresponds to the error between your approximation and the true value using that value of H that you declared. So this is the error committed when using H equal one, and then H equals 0 0.97, whatever, all the way. This is the error committed by using an H value of 10 to the minus five. Okay. Nathan, it's order 10 to the minus five similar to the order of H, okay? Now I wanna plot on a log log, the errors and versus the H values. I'm gonna put H here and put errors here. Got a straight line as expected. The slope of this line is one, exactly one because this is a method of order one. So a plot of the error versus spacing is gonna result in a straight line with a slope of one, okay? The highest error occurs at the highest value of H, but then as we cut it and cut it and cut it and cut it, it's gonna continue coming down with a slope of one. So cutting the plane right in the middle. Okay. 
when you see plots like this in my in my work, to get to a plot like this probably takes us sometimes calculations that take months. And in the end, you just want to show one plot like that. And it gets us, gets our heart racing. Okay. Gets our heart racing. Okay. <laughs> actually show you just a paper that we're actually um, writing right now, okay? I'll show you a paper we're writing right now that has order of accuracy. And I think I showed you this before, maybe. Maybe I showed you this before. Something similar. Okay. Okay, so what you're seeing here, you see these plots here? These plots, these are error versus spacing. My spacing here is time step size. So we're developing a method that is third order in time. And all of these error plots, they're showing the infinity norm of the error. So when you, when you go in 3D, you know, you got to get a norm of all of those errors. You don't have one error at one point. And all of these methods are third order, order delta T cubed. So the slope is three. And furthermore, this is a fourth order method. <laughs> so this is not toy stuff, okay? This is real stuff. All right. Let's go back to our slides. Forward difference. Da, 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 da. Okay, so we did this right now. About the absolute error. Okay. Okay, so now you have these data. So now we're gonna go back to discrete data. We kind of keep pivoting, switching back and forth between continuous and discrete. So there's really not much kind of difference here in this case, but we use the continuous function to validate and verify that our method, our implementation is correct. But suppose now you have discrete data, you start from the left, you know, at x1 or x0, you do fx1 or f1 minus f0 over h, and then f2 minus to evaluate the derivative. But what happens when you reach the last point? What happens when you reach the last point? At the last point, your derivative is fn plus one minus fn over h, but you don't have fn plus one. Right? So what do you do? Pardon me? fn minus one, okay. F, fn minus one, yeah, okay. That's correct. <laughs> what's, what's your name? Ethan, yes, Ethan. I sorry, changing your mask. <laughs> it's a different color. I okay. So Ethan is saying, well, you know, he cannot look forward. Why not go backward? There's no reason to define the slope only using fi plus one. We can define the slope using a point to the back, which would be a great idea over there because we had a barrier. So could we use fn minus one? instead of n plus fn plus one? Well, yeah, turns out that's exactly what we're gonna do. So we're gonna take the Taylor series now. The reason I go back to Taylor series is because to develop higher order methods, you need to go to the Taylor series, again, always. For a simple first order method like this, you can just kind of guess the slope, fi minus one minus fi, you know? But what if now, instead of writing the Taylor series at xi plus one around xi, what if you write it at xi minus one, f at xi minus one around point xi? Okay, so now you can already see these were the terms that we neglected, and you have f prime xi as a function of xi minus one, f of xi minus one, and f of xi. So if you do the same, if you follow the same strategy we did before, Okay, you get this, and then you solve for f prime. You get a new formula for the derivative based on fi and fi minus one, rather than fi and fi plus one. 
So now this new formula, which we call the backward difference formula because you're using the point behind you, okay? It says your derivative at point i is the value of the function at i, fi, minus fi minus one over h. It commits the same error as the previous method. So based on order h, this is a first order method. That's what we say, okay? Use that nomenclature. We'll give you an exam. Consider a third order method. You should immediately know that this means this is a method with an error order h cubed, and the error is equal a constant times h to the power three. That's what a third order method means. Visually, if this were the true slope, this would be the backward difference slope. It's still kind of way off for this case. Okay, great. So now, using these two formulas, forward and backward difference, you can totally find derivatives in a set of data. Starting from the beginning, you use forward. In the middle, you can use forward or backwards, it doesn't matter. But at the end, you have to use the backward because you don't have an extra point outside. And don't say you can extrapolate, you can't, okay? Because now I'm gonna ask you to find the derivative at that extrapolated point. <laughs> okay, so now you ask, could we develop methods that are order h squared? Okay, yes. But now we have to start thinking a little bit more creatively and combine Taylor series with each other. I'll give you an example of how we do one method because develop, there's a way to do it in general for arbitrary order, but it's kind of beyond the scope of what we're gonna do here. But for a second order method, there's a very simple way to do it. So I'm gonna give you these two Taylor series, fi plus one and fi minus one, both around point i, okay? And then I'll ask you to combine them in a smart way, you know, add them, subtract them, multiply them, whatever you want, okay? To come up with an estimate for f prime i, but that is second order. So the truncation error has an h squared in it. Now, because I know the answer, your goal is gonna be to combine them in a way such that you elim eliminate this h squared term, h squared of double prime. Because if you eliminate that term, then your error is gonna be this guy, and then you divide by h, so it becomes second order. So try to combine them to get rid of h squared of double prime. Just focus on that term. How would you combine these fi plus one and fi minus one to get rid of the h squared term? Like add them, subtract them, multiply one by two and the other by half, whatever. You're done for the day. <laughs> So I put them on top of each other, draw a horizontal line under them, and think about adding, subtracting, and carry it out, okay? So just go ahead and draw a horizontal line over here, and either add or multiply or subtract. You clearly don't wanna multiply or divide. You can either add or subtract. Oops, I'm sorry. Okay, so now pull out F prime. I need a formula for F prime. Yeah, good work, yeah. And then truncate the errors and write them as order H squared. You've done this, I guess, before. Are you trying to kind of work it through? I really advise you to work it through. 
because you're going to have to work it on your exams, okay? It would be a silly reason to have to work it because you have to work it on the exam, but Yeah, now pull out. Once you're done, you got to pull out F prime. I need a formula for F prime, okay? A second order formula for F prime. So write it as F prime equals something plus order H squared. That's what I need. Fi plus one, Fi minus one, right? Oh, that's the <laughs> this doesn't this doesn't make yeah. sense. You can't compute this, right? Yeah, I wasn't looking at yeah? yeah. Okay. Many of you are have already got it. So don't forget the F. Do not forget the left hand side. Fi plus one and Fi minus one. Those are legitimate values that you're gonna use. When we did one Taylor series, we used Fi plus one, right? So here we're gonna use those as well, okay? You can work together. What's your name? Lizzie. Lizzie. Do you wanna share the answer with us? When I, you want me? Yeah, this is perfect. Mm -hmm. That's perfect, yep, that's very correct. Okay, give you more seconds. You don't have to get the error term exactly, you know, just the order is what matters, right? Okay, so I'm gonna call upon um, Lizzie. Yeah, what, got a great answer for us. What was the your formula? F prime I equal? plus order h, a squared, correct, yep. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna subtract these two formulas. So fi plus one minus fi minus one. So that's what you get on the left-hand side. You cannot get, these terms are important. These are values that you're gonna use to estimate the derivative. fi minus fi, zero, very nice. HF prime I minus minus HF prime I. So that gives you two HF prime I. Now the H squared term is gonna, you're gonna subtract it. And then you get an H cubed term, okay? I don't care what you do with the coefficient, but that H cubed term is gonna eventually be divided by H. So it becomes, this is, this is the error, right? All of these, we know these FI, FI prime, we're after F prime. We don't know this guy, and that's what we're going to neglect. Now it has h cubed, but we're going to divide it by h, so it becomes h squared, and that's a second order error. So when you solve for f prime, this is what you get, fi plus one minus fi minus one over two h plus order h squared, a second order method. And only using two points. It doesn't cost you anything more than the first order methods, right? The first order methods used fi plus one and fi or fi minus one and fi. This one used fi plus one and fi minus one, no more points, but gives you a second order method, okay? It squares your accuracy, which is amazing. And this is called the central difference formula. Visually, if this is your true slope, this is your central difference slope. Jake, check this out. Central difference slope. Of course, because it's going to be, it's a higher accuracy method. It works particularly well in these situations. Okay. So in summary, we learned for the first derivative, we learned three formulas. Look, I'm putting approximation. I was worried I had equal signs here, but <laughs> approximately fi plus one minus fi over h forward difference backward difference fi minus fi minus one over h and central difference, okay? So now, if you have data like this, 
You can use the central difference everywhere in the middle, everywhere you can. And when you reach the edges, on the left edge, you use a forward difference. And on the right edge, you use a backward difference. Okay? But yeah, before I get to that, um, okay. Let's see? Okay, so we might be able to do, before we do the Python activity, we're running out of time. Um, I'll ask you, what is the problem with this approach? Using central in the middle and forward on the left and backward on the right. In terms of errors specifically. What do you mean? Uh-huh, what does that mean? Like a what? How so? Uh huh. You can still compare. There's still derivatives, but you're right that we have different errors. But the implications of this is that your global error is going to be your worst error. That's going to dominate because your total error in this problem is going to be ch squared and ch, and the leading order term is always going to be ch, always. So you got you had no benefit from globally from using a second order approximation here now. If you're doing this just to evaluate a derivative once at you know these points, that's fine. You get second order accuracy in the middle and first order at the edges. But for something that has to do with heat transfer fluid mechanics, these errors are gonna be propagated because of the fluid flow and the heat transfer. And you're gonna contaminate. Your entire, your entire computational domain, and you'll get a first order error everywhere. If you commit a first order error somewhere in your domain within a few time steps or iterations, whatever, you're gonna contaminate everywhere. So for this case, for just a function, might just be okay for some set of data, use second order accuracy on the middle, first order on the edges, and that's it, move on with life. But for problems where you're actually, you have transport mechanisms and you're continuously, you're moving information from the boundary to the inside and vice versa, you're contaminating your entire calculation, okay, with low order errors. So it's a bad idea to do it for, these pro for those problems, okay? Then what that means, we have to develop higher order forward and backward differences. Okay, I'll show you the formulas um, next Tuesday, okay? All right, have a good week and I'll sign assign the homework on this and the integration today, okay?